Hello, hello. Welcome to Alpha Beta Soup, where we unpack Bitcoin using on-chain analysis. I'm TXMC. In our first few videos, we've been putting together a case for a supply squeeze forming in the underlying dynamics of Bitcoin. All of that still looks on track as we hang out here under the 50,000 price level. Now, over the next few days, it'll be very important that we continue to go up and eventually make it through a couple of key retracement levels here between 54 and 57,000 on the price chart. So I think today would be a great opportunity to look at potential market top situations using a couple of models that are kind of fun to play with and give us some targets to shoot for based on historical patterns in Bitcoin's price. So let's not waste any time. This is where we'll start today. And this is the top cap model. It's called top price here because I have it adjusted to show spot price instead of market cap. The top price model was invented by another analyst named Willy Wu. And if you're interested in on-chain analytics and you don't know who Willy Wu is, I'll leave a link to his website in the description. He's one of the pioneers of this space, and many of the metrics and perspectives we use are influenced by Willy's work. The top cap model attempts to find the price peak in Bitcoin markets based on another metric called the average cap or the average price. The average price is the lifetime moving average of Bitcoin's price. So if you add up the closing price every day for Bitcoin and you divide it by the number of days that Bitcoin has been in existence, you'll get the average price. That is on this chart as the blue line at the bottom. Now this line by itself doesn't have a lot of meaning for the price of Bitcoin. It doesn't really catch market bottoms. Price doesn't come back to test it very often, but it does have a significance as a multiple of future price. The top price is shown here in red, and it's this top line. All this is, is the average price times 35. Now, Willy Wu, who invented this, to my knowledge, never wrote out the methodology behind why he chose 35. If I had to guess, it would be that he was trying different multiples of the average price to see which ones had stickiness as far as historical price goes. When he landed on 35, it seemed to line up very well. And you can notice here there are numerous market points where it hits that red line. These are those spots. In the bull market of 2011, the double pump of 2013 and 2014, and the blow-off top at the end of 2017 all came and met the top price. I find that pretty interesting. Even if average price times 35 is a bit arbitrary in definition, it seems to have some kind of a symmetry to it. That gives it some credence as a possible target for the future. So that is what the top price is. It is a simple attempt to catch the tops of markets. And we can see that in 2021, we haven't gotten anywhere near it, but we did come close to this yellow line here. So let's take a moment to talk about that. The top price, as I mentioned, was created by Willy Woo. And as I've been going through my journey learning about on-chain, I've been going and unpacking a lot of these metrics that previous analysts have built. It's a way that I learn and experiment, and it also helps me to get more familiar with the workings of the data. This model, the top cap model, was one of the first ones I really dove into because I thought there was something interesting about it. How could average price times 35 find market tops? So I started thinking, are there other multiples of average price that similarly have a significance to historical price for Bitcoin? Enter the mid price, which is shown here as this yellow line, where average price is the lifetime historical moving average of Bitcoin's price, and the top price is the average price times 35. The mid price is the average price times 17.5, which is just the midway point between the average and the top price. The reason it seems so much closer to the top price on this chart is because this axis is logarithmic, not linear. So it moves in an exponential fashion. But this yellow line is mathematically the average midway point between this red and this blue value. So that is the mid price. And when we walk it back through Bitcoin's history, the mid price also holds its own significance in numerous places. Here are the places where mid price comes into play. 
each of these moments are near to market tops, but not quite at the market top. The 2011 market briefly kissed the mid price before a pullback and the final parabolic push into the blow off top that actually met the top price here in mid 2011. In 2013, after the original market top, there was a brief pullback and then a sucker's rally that peaked at the mid price. The same thing happened here in 2014. The original blow off top, there was a pullback, a sucker's rally into the mid price, and then the bear market began. Over here in 2018, similar pattern, but a bit different. Rather than a pullback and then a rally up to the mid price, price actually bounced off of the mid price on its way down. In 2021, we haven't actually broken the mid price, and in fact, it acted as the market top in the spring. This is very intriguing to me. While mid price being 17.5 times the average price seems arbitrary, it also shows a historical significance in moments before and after market peaks. While the mid price itself is not attempting to catch a top, when we see this kind of pattern of significance, in my view, it helps to give confidence to the original top price model that it's built off of. It helps to strengthen the idea that maybe these multiples do have some weight in the potential outcome of Bitcoin's price. The last line we'll talk about on this model is called the low price, represented here in green, where the top price in red is the average price times 35, and where the mid price is halfway between the top and the average. The low price is the top price divided by eight, which ends up being the average price times 4.375. 35 divided by eight is 4.375. You don't need to remember that, but what you might find interesting is just how often the low price has been relevant for Bitcoin. These are all of the moments where the low price and the actual spot price for Bitcoin interacted. As you can see, there are a lot of instances. In 2011, in the original run-up, low price acted as resistance at two different points. After the blow-off top, it also acted as resistance on the way down. In 2013, it acted as resistance on the way up to the eventual bull market. In 2014, price caught it twice in the double-pump bull market between these two peaks. Once here, and once here. And you can see a pattern before and after bull market peaks of the low price first acting as resistance as price is below it, it churns right around the line and once it's able to capture it as support, it uses it as a springboard. Coming back down here in the bear market of 2018, you can see price kind of drags along it before finally capitulating and breaking below. And as it chops around looking for strength, there's a lot of disagreement over the price of Bitcoin amongst day-to-day -day traders as price hangs around in this low price area. And you can see here in mid-2020, just before the most recent bull run, it finally caught the low price as support once more. Similar to the mid-price line, the low price line doesn't call market tops, but by having such a significant relationship with the historical price of Bitcoin, it helps to add additional strength and conviction to the concepts behind this model. Predicting the top of a market is virtually impossible. A lot of it is based on guesswork, projections, and historical patterns. Patterns don't have to repeat themselves, but they often do. And so by using models like this, we can get a general idea of where we might aim in the next market cycle were it to have similar characteristics. Here is the live chart of the top price. And just to cap off this module of the video, we'll zoom in here and I'll show you what the current prices are. As of September 18th, right now, the top price listed in this model is $191,000. I can't say for certain with any conviction that Bitcoin will actually hit $191,000, but what I can say is that based on the historical accuracy of the top price model, $191,000 seems like a reasonable target for a proper blow-off bull run, considering that Bitcoin has found its way to this line at every blow-off point in its previous history. And considering how close the market top in April got to the mid price, I think it's realistic to expect that we at least get to this point in this current market before rolling over. And right now the mid price is around 94,000. These are not price projections. This is just a model. All models are wrong and some of them are useful. This one provides interesting thoughts 
and I like to keep it in mind as we move through market cycles so that we can see how well it holds up. Maybe the model will break and we'll have to throw it aside. Maybe it will be right again. We'll see. The next top model that we'll look at together is one that I put together recently, and it relates to the long-term holder and short-term holder supply that we've talked about at length on this channel. What you're looking at now is long-term holder supply. For a coin to be long-term held, it must have been purchased and then not moved for 155 days or five months. After that point, it becomes statistically very unlikely to be moved again. The supply held by long-term holders moves in a reliable pattern. As prices break the previous all-time high in bull markets, long-term holders sell their coins into strength. When market tops come in and price rolls over, long-term holders are beginning to net accumulate. This pattern repeats itself throughout history. Price breaks the previous high, long-term holders sell, we hit a bull market top, price rolls over, long-term holders are in accumulation. Next market phase, price breaks the previous high, they're selling, by the time price rolls over, they're in net accumulation mode. This has happened every time. So with that pattern in mind, my thinking is, how can we use this cyclical behavior to pull out some kind of data signal that lets us know when the smart money has begun accumulating again? Because this group seems very adept at identifying when we have reached a market top and it's time to reset. So how would we do that? There are two groups in this perspective of data. We have the long-term holders, which as I mentioned are folks who have coins for at least five months. And then on the other side we have short-term holders. Whenever long-term holders spend their coins, there's only one place for them to go, and that is into the hands of short-term holders. When long-term holder supply begins to decline, we can assume that short-term holder supply is accelerating at the same pace. When long-term holder supply begins to grow, we can assume likewise that short-term holder supply has begun to shrink. This relationship can give us an idea how to properly signal when trend shifts have occurred in the underlying supply dynamics. This orange line is an attempt to do that. This is tracking the rolling rate of change of short-term holder supply. Now, when you first look at this line, the untrained eye might think that this looks like spaghetti but we'll walk through how this works. So this oscillator is tracking the rate of change of coins entering and leaving short-term hands. Coins leave the long-term holder bucket and become short-term coins immediately upon being sold by a long-term hand. Their lifespan starts over at zero, and those coins begin aging again. And five months later, if they haven't moved, they graduate into being a long-term coin. So short-term holder supply has new coins enter it very quickly and old coins leave it very slowly. Likewise, long-term holder supply has new coins entering its group very slowly, but coins leave it immediately upon being sold out of long-term holder supply. By looking at this oscillator here, we can see that there's kind of a middle area here that it hangs out in, kind of a baseline activity level that goes from the middle of this yellow area here down to the white. And for the purposes of this exercise, we can kind of ignore this activity. This is just baseline churn between short-term and long-term holders constantly selling coins, aging coins back and forth over years and years of Bitcoin's life. What I'm very much interested in for the purpose of this oscillator and for identifying when market trends have changed are these spikes. You see these? These are the moments here. These are the moments when short-term holder supply begins to grow extremely quickly. The rate of change, the rate of growth of short-term holder supply accelerates dramatically. That is the indication that long-term holders have begun to sell. And when they sell, those coins become short-term coins. And this group in orange sees its number grow very quickly. So at first, this group sees an increase in coins, a dramatic increase in coins. And then the rate of growth begins to slow down. This dotted line here, where the yellow breaks down and becomes white, this is 0%. When the orange line is above this spot right here, it means that short-term holders are growing in size. When it breaks below this line, it means that their supply is shrinking in size. For short-term holder supply to be shrinking, long-term holder supply must be growing. 
these two share a symbiotic relationship. For one to grow, the other must shrink. When this line spikes, short-term holders are growing, long-term holders are shrinking. As this line retreats and gets back down to zero, this signifies that short-term holders absorbed a bunch of coins and have now, as it breaks below zero, begun giving those coins back to long-term holders. This capitulation here is the growth of long-term holders and the reversal of a market. Let's look at this with some visual aids. First, we'll take off the long-term holder supply. This is the oscillator by itself. Here are all of the instances where the fractal played out the way that we're looking for, and I'll walk you through some of these. Each of these green lines signifies a moment when long-term holders begin selling their coins to short-term hands. The supply of coins began quickly transferring from long-term to short-term. Thus, you see the spike in activity for short-term supply. It grows quickly. And then, over a period of days or weeks, eventually that group's growth falls back below 0%. The growth rate becomes negative, which means that the supply for short-term hands has begun to shrink again. And that is where you see these purple arrows. These purple arrows are moments when the supply has spiked to an extreme up to this red zone and then found its way back below zero. This fractal that we're looking for, this pattern, does not trigger unless we get this spike. So this activity here where we just see it kind of chopping around in the yellow, this is not what we're looking for. This over here is not what we're looking for. These spikes are what we're looking for. Quick rate of change from a baseline activity, quick rate of change. And what you'll see as you're starting to, your eyes kind of adjust to all this activity here, what you'll notice if you start lining up these arrows with price activity behind it in black, you'll see that the green arrows tend to come in as price is going up and spiking, and the purple arrows, the end of the fractal, when short-term holder supply begins to shrink, are coming in when price is rolling over and typically just before the true bear market begins. Here, we get the spike right at the market top. Then short-term holders begin to shrink, and at this moment here, it finally breaks below zero at this point in the price action, just before we hit the bear market. Here, we got another little spike. This one is a bit of an anomaly, but it's worth recording, and it led to this small movement in price here. And this looks like it isn't very much, but in this moment, price went from $6 down to $3. That's a 50% drop. In 2012, that was a big deal. What you'll notice is that most of these instances occur near market peaks. You can see here, this one in 2014 actually took a bit of time to play out. The spike happened at the beginning right as price was apexing. And then a couple of months later, long-term holders were still selling to short-term hands. You can see this chopping around before it finally capitulates and short-term holders begin to shrink. Long-term holders are accumulating. By, by this point here. There's a couple other moments. This one gets triggered, and by the time it actually capitulates, it's over here, and this is kind of in the base, and this is probably one of the weaker of the signals, you know, because we're already kind of in a bear phase. There is some price drop in here that's a bit hidden because, you know, this, this, we're zoomed out, but this is probably one of the weaker ones. However, each major market top has been captured by the same signal. Here in 2017, it actually happened much earlier. This is the well-documented capitulation of long-term hands that occurred after we finally broke over this previous all-time high of $1,100. This was a super long Mt. Gox bear market that we had. And once we finally broke over, there were a ton of old coins spent right here. And that's the spike that you see. It took a few months of this to play out, and eventually short-term holders finally began shrinking at this moment here. And if you follow this line up, it's right after the market peak. This one here, right after the mid-cycle peak in mid-2019. And then this moment here occurred in January and February. And it told you the market was over by mid-March. Let's line these up a little better on the price for you. Each of these purple circles are the end of the pattern that we just described. And each of these stars are the place on the price chart where it tells you that the market has o is over and that price is likely to continue to go down from here. You can see it's pretty freaking accurate. It got this one right here. It got this right. It got this right. It got this right. It got this one, this one, and this one right. This one is a price drop. There is a price drop in this area, as I mentioned, but it's probably the weakest of the signal. What's interesting right here is that this is a fake out. Look, 
Short-term holders, they see a spike. Long-term holders are selling. For some reason, they're selling right here, right as we break over this basin. Maybe they think we're not coming back. And so we get down below this level, price finally breaks over it, they sell some, and nothing really happens. They continue to sell to short-term hands for a while here. It just kind of chops around. And this is a break of the pattern. This is not the fractal holding. And eventually, it finally just kind of capitulates over here. But this, this here is not what we're looking for. It's this. It's this. It's this. This model is not perfect. It's clearly a thought experiment. It's something I threw together as a way to visualize the story of trend shift in underlying supply between short and long-term hands. But what's really interesting is that it tells a very accurate story of how markets roll over. Once you understand the market forces that are playing out behind this orange line, which just looks like a bunch of spaghetti, it really tells you what is happening to the players in the Bitcoin market. We're seeing the coins moving from long-term to short-term hands, the conviction of weak investors and strong investors playing back and forth. This is what on-chain data lets us see that no other traditional financial instrument will show you. This is the kind of thing that gets me excited to get out of bed every day and start diving into the charts. If I were to make an assessment about our current place in this market, I feel based on some of the evidence that I've seen that the market we're in now closely resembles the 2013-2014 double pump bull run market. It feels that way. It feels like we hit a semi-capitulative moment in our 50% correction in May, and that we are now positioning ourselves for a second leg up like this, rather than this kind of bull bear cycle. I strongly feel it's something closer to this, and that this moment here was here for us. We can see the recovery beginning down here. We haven't seen the spike. We probably won't until price gets back over 64K. We've spoken about this at length in previous videos. But since we're talking about this, and since we've covered this so much on this channel, I do think it's important to make you aware as my community that I feel that we are in the middle of a proper bull market. It does not feel like we are at the end of a cycle. It feels like there's still much more to go, even though demand has been on the lower side. There was a proper bear cycle over the summer, and a lot of what we're seeing gives off the same smoke signals as the end of a bear market. So I strongly believe that we are in a similar phase to this period right here. It's playing out over a longer time frame because this asset is exponentially larger than it was eight years ago. But uh, I, I do feel that we are kind of in one of these phases and not in one of these phases. It's not solely based on this chart, but I'm using this to show you and give you an idea of what I'm thinking. So what we'll be looking for in the next bull phase of this market is for long-term holders to continue stacking as they have been, to continue to increase their holdings until price gets near the all-time high. We see volume increasing, casual retail interest comes back to the market, people FOMO in, buying Bitcoin at any price, euphoria, mania, excitement, jubilance, all of those things that come with a bull market. And that what we need to look for at the end is this pattern. When we start to see this pattern of long-term holders quickly dumping their coins into the hands of short-term buyers, we need to wait and watch and see that value spike into the extreme zones and then make its way back down to zero. And once we see that, based on how historically accurate this system has been at identifying the ends of bull markets, that will tell us that long-term holders are in net accumulation mode, and you should be too. All right, that's what I wanted to show you guys today. I don't want to waste your time going over the same charts that we've gone over in previous videos if there isn't something new to talk about, but I do think it's important to continue our education, continue peeling back the onion, looking for new things, new angles, new perspectives. Make sure you follow me on Twitter, at TXMC Trades. I post analysis and content all the time. You'll find out about my videos and other things I'm getting involved in. You'll see the new content we're putting out at Glassnode. Make sure that you keep an eye on my Twitter feed over the next couple of days because I recorded a podcast with Will Clemente and Checkmate on Will's channel, Blockware Intelligence, where we have a masterclass discussion in all things on-chain. I think you'll really enjoy that. Keep an eye out for that link. In the meantime, we'll continue looking at the charts. We'll keep an eye on Bitcoin as we always do. 
If something starts to change, if the winds begin to shift in a different direction, we'll reassess our thesis of the supply squeeze, and we'll be sure to talk about it as a community. I'm really enjoying making these videos for you, and I hope that you are learning something and finding value in the way that we talk about Bitcoin together. I hope you have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves, friends. We'll speak again soon.